we're very excited. Uh, we would like to welcome you to the first Conic Chris meetup. Um, for the last three months, we have envisioned having a nationwide conversation about honey crisp, about honey crisp with you, the, the fruit growers, extension educators and scientists this summer. This extension effort between Washington State University, Michigan State University, and Cornell University is conducted in close collaboration with IFTA, the USDA SCRI Root to Fruit Project, and Good Fruit Grower Magazine. With so much new information generated through the Root to Fruit project about honey crease, we believe there is a tremendous value in having an open discussion and in an inclusive virtual format this summer. The webinar series today, June 3rd, June 17th, and July 1st, every Thursday for the next every two weeks, is accessible and free to all to participate. Today's webinar on crop load management will include a video clip, a very short one from the IFTA recordings, followed by two short talks presented by professors Robinson and Musagi. We hope the Honey Chris meetups will be the right setting for you to find the best technical information based on the most recent root to fruit science. Please, get comfortable, enjoy the webinar, the new format, and tie your questions in the chat box. We believe there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. Thanks for your participation. The Honey Chris, Mirat team, Bernardita Sayato, Anna Wallis, and myself. I wanted to use the 15 minutes that's allocated to me to give a little bit of a background uh, presentation on why crop load management is so important from a physiological standpoint, primarily with the intention of trying to stimulate some discussion. Let me review the three primary reasons we manage crop load and particularly with Honeycrisp. <clears throat> the most important reason is to control biennial bearing. The extreme biennial bearing habit of this variety has very large economic consequences. In the off year, farms, uh, cash flows can be severely harmed if their honey crisp percentage of their total crop exceeds 20%. But it also has large consequences on fruit quality and what we deliver to the consumer. The second reason we manage crop load is to obtain the proper fruit size. Honey crisp has a large natural fruit size, but if crop load is too high, fruit size is smaller than optimum economic size. On the other hand, if it's too low, then fruit size is too large. And that's really a problem, mostly for Washington growers where fruit size is excessive. But a factor that's often not considered, and Bruce Allen alluded to it in the video we just watched, is that fruit quality is severely impacted, especially with Honeycrisp, more so than any other variety I've ever worked with. Its fruit color is severely harmed when it's overcropped. Fruit flavor is severely harmed. Fruit maturity is affected. And of course, bitter pit is uh, related to crop load in, in a very important way with large fruit size having more bitter pit and small fruit size having less. I'm not gonna focus at all on these uh, in this presentation on points number two and three. I'm gonna just focus my discussion on this biannual bearing aspect of Honeycrisp. To do that, I wanna present this diagram, which I borrowed from my colleague, Martin Goffinet, who's an anatomist to try to walk us through what happens within a spur and the bore shoot of Honeycrisp? You'll see in this diagram on the lower, more horizontal uh, uh, direction is a spur. And at the tip of that spur is a flowering cluster. Below that are two spur leaves. And then these small bracts <clears throat> that are right in the axles of the fruits. But the first leaf below the fruit cluster will often have a latent bud, which produces a new shoot called the bore shoot. That bore shoot grows sometimes two or three inches long, sometimes six inches long, sometimes only half an inch long. But it tends to set a terminal bud at a certain point in the season, usually about this time. And then within that bud develops a flower bud for the next year. Now, gibberellins, that I want to focus on in this presentation are produced in shoot tips and in seeds. So every shoot and its tip is producing gibberellins. 
But gibberellin is an anti-flowering hormone. So a shoot that's growing, a regular extension shoot, won't set a flower bud because the shoot tip is producing a lot of gibberellin. Likewise, this small bore shoot, when it's growing, it's producing gibberellin. But once it slows down and starts to set a terminal bud, it stops producing gibberellin. However, seeds from these developing fruits produce high amounts of gibberellin that's transported within the spur structure that inhibit this terminal bud from forming a flower bud. On the other hand, other hormones, particularly cytokinins and ethylene, by the way, and some other hormones promote flower initiation. Now it's the balance between the flower promoting hormones and GAs that determines whether this terminal bud inside the bore shoot, um, now it stopped growing and it's uh, setting a terminal bud, determines whether that meristem is converted to a floral meristem or remains vegetative. So when we talk about uh, why is there so much biennial bearing in Honeycrisp, it's just very sensitive in its flower initiation to excess GA. And so this number of seeds that we have on the tree and particularly the number of seeds we have within the fruits of a particular spur system becomes important. So I want to introduce a term to you today that I want you to think about. Is it seed load that we're worried about or crop load? I argue that it's seed load within the spur cluster. The total number of seeds within that cluster is an important factor that determines the amount of GA that's running around or being transported within this spur cluster and affecting that vegetative meristem and prevents it from becoming floral. So in years when we have a very high blossom density, meaning that there's a lot of spurs that flower, the on year, the seed number in the initial part of that growing season is so high that GA levels are just extremely high and they overcome any flower promotion hormone that exists within the tree. Now, this is a serious problem because uh, Honeycrisp, when it's low vigor, gets into these on years. And if it's not pruned, as Bruce was saying, with precision pruning, you can sometimes have three, four, or 500 flower clusters per tree on a tree that should have only 100 fruits. When you have that level of flower clusters relative to your final fruit number, you're almost guaranteed to become biannual because if you have 300 fruits, and every one of those fruits has 10 seeds, or 300 clusters, and every cluster has five fruits, and every fruit has 10 seeds, the number of seeds of producing GA is extremely high. Now, you can envision that in other years where seed number is low within the fruit, say you had poor pollination weather, and instead of 10 seeds, you only have four or five, or there's just fewer flowering clusters, the total GA load in that tree is much lower, and hence, you can try to get, you can get flower initiation without much trouble. Now, a second thing that I wanted to emphasize is from a physiological perspective is work that Pollyanna did when she was working with me while I was gone on leave. And that shows that the timing of flower initiation for Honeycrisp is earlier than any other variety we work with. She looked at New York at when we could see evidence within the bud, that bore shoot bud, of a future flower by looking for what we call doming. And of all the varieties she looked at, Honeycrisp had the earliest timing for flower initiation. In New York, that was just 30 to 45 days after full bloom, which is in June. <clears throat> so when we think about um, why it's so important to manage both flower bud load through pruning and then seed numbers, it leads us to these conclusions that precision pruning to manage flower blood load is very important because of two reasons. And I'm not gonna focus at all on the first reason, but when honeycrisp trees are very weak and they have excessive number of flower buds, whatever nitrogen the root system takes up or cytokine it produces divided into many, fewer, many buds and every bud gets too little and is weak and they produce small suit size and are very biennial. But the second reason is where I want to focus. When you have excessive flower bud numbers because you didn't prune correctly, the number of seeds is astronomical. Let me give two examples. If you had honeycrisp that you pruned according to our recommended level, which is 
1.8 times the number of final fruits. In this case, I said that I want 71 fruits, so my target flowering spurs is 131. But every one of those spurs has five fruits, and every fruit could potentially have 10 seeds. So I have a potential of 6,550 seeds on that tree once the flowers set. But if you use an alternative example for a honeycrisp tree that was not pruned correctly and it had 300 flowering spurs, you could have 15,000 seeds. And that number of seeds, you cannot overcome the negative effects of GA no matter what you do. And so this pruning to get the bud number correct is essential. Now, second question. Why is blossom thinning so important for honeycrisp? Well, it's because those excessive, uh, it, the excessive number of fruits from bloom until we get hand thinning, say a month later, results in excessive GA that inhibits flower formation. And since we know that honeycrisp sets flower or has flower initiation very early, oftentimes at the moment you would get flower initiation, there's still too many fruits on the tree. And so remember that excessive fruits from bloom up through about 15 to 20 millimeter fruit size is what causes the excessive GA that gives us biennial bearing. I wanna throw out another little wrinkle into this. The return bloom sprays that we're putting on, which are either NA or ethyl, have been remarkably inconsistent. I've got data over 10 years showing that four out of the 10 years I get a very nice response from either summer NAA or summer ethereal, and I probably have six years out of 10 where I get almost no response. And the work of Pollyanna showing the very earliness of the flower initiation timing has led us to rethink what we're doing with summer NAA and summer ethereal sprays. Now, in the second bulleted point, a uh, sub point is that for many years, we've recommended four summer sprays based 10 days apart, starting on the longest day of the year, June 21st in the Northern Hemisphere, of either 10 parts of NAA or a pint of ethereal. This is usually once fruits achieve 25 millimeters in diameter. And the thinking of this recommendation is we didn't want the ethereal or the NAA to cause thinning. And so when fruits are smaller than 20 millimeters, there's a possibility of thinning. And so we waited till they were bigger than 20 to 25 and then started spraying. However, with Honeycrisp, with the much earlier flower initiation, I've started to think over the last several years that the timing of these summer sprays is too late and we should move them up in the growing season to get a better response. So we're starting to recommend a four spray schedule of ethereal starting when fruits are 16 millimeters, which is about where we're at in New York right now, a little bit past. Now the risk for this is that if you start ethereal sprays earlier during when the moment when fruits can be thinned, those sprays could cause thinning. And the way they could cause thinning is if rate is too high or temperatures are above 80 degrees. So this kind of recommendation we're moving to, which I hope we can discuss as we talk about this in a few minutes, is riskier. But having no bloom next year is even riskier than that from an economic perspective. And so I think we can manage this and manage the risk and still get, uh, improve our, uh, the effect of these uh, return bloom sprays by moving them earlier. Let me end by just saying, Crop load management starts with pruning. You have to not have too many buds, flower buds on that tree or there's no way you're gonna prevent the biennial bearing. We suggest pruning to 1.8 buds for final target fruit number. Secondly, blossom thinning is essential. If you don't blossom thin, you're almost always gonna get biennial bearing uh, from the on year when there's just too many fruits on the tree from bloom until 20 millimeters. Even if you thin well, there's still too many seeds out there producing GA. Third, we should start thinking about seed load per fruit and seed load per tree because they're important determinants of biennial bearing. The seed load per spur can be managed by blossom thinning where with ATS or lime sulfur, we hope we can take off all the lateral fruits leaving only one and reduce the seed number per spur to just 10 instead of 50. And lastly, return bloom sprays, if they're done early, 
are more likely to stimulate flower initiation than later sprays with Honeycrisp, but they carry some risk. So with that, I'll stop and hope that this little presentation of some physiology will generate some discussion.